Welcome everybody to the American Space Museum. I'm Mark Marquette and this is ending our seventh week due to the COVID pandemic of bringing you a little program to help you stay curious. And we definitely have to say after two months of this something good has come out of this because you enjoy seeing our little program and we enjoy doing it to you so it's in our plans to continue this. We've got some behind milling around here. We've had a meeting with our docents, a COVID a conscious meeting to outline how we're going to open up Monday, June 1st with masks required. We will respect your civil liberties, but please, you have to respect our volunteers, many of them who are retired and in that pandemic range uh, to get the virus, myself included. So we will be opening. We're making plans for that. It'll be after the man launch next Wednesday, which all things look good on that. And good to see Jack here and Lorraine bunch of our old friends walking by here that we've definitely missed. Uh, we yesterday put on our Facebook page and constant contact email this t-shirt. Marty Winkles, my cameraman. Marty's going to zoom in on this. is one of the two styles of t-shirts that we're selling for $28 shipping included. Uh, it's an event on our Facebook to celebrate uh, Bob Benkin and Doug Hurley's launch next Wednesday on the first NASA commercial crew on SpaceX's Crew Dragon spaceship. We hope other NASA commercial crew astronauts will get up in the air next year on Boeing Starliner and uh, just uh, the start of things to come. So you can own this shirt and there's another version of it uh, and a black version also, a uh, black cloth version on, uh, on our uh, website. Uh, on, and Facebook, so we hope you see that. See Ozzy, good to see the Rocket Hobo. Come over here, Rocket Hobo. Sure. How you doing, man? Not so bad. Good. How you think things are? Come over here on this side behind okay. me. Here, we had Ozzy featured the other day, and uh, uh, the the uh, we can tell our guests that are coming that he's out at Space View Park has been for a decade or more. Everything gonna go off there, right? You're going to yes. have a ton of people. To, uh, uh, tell yes. them that what's the logistics of it. Um, you can visit spaceviewpark.com. There are directions there on how to get to the park. Uh, it also tells you not to come and where to tune in on the internet, nasa.gov slash ntv for NASA TV. Uh, but if you come to the park, do please wear a mask. Those 20 or 50,000 that will, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's going to be crowded. We know that because this is a very historic launch. The first manned launch from American soil since the last space shuttle flight in 2011. So if people really want to see it, people will come out. Um, so please, respect the masks and the distances and, and uh, uh, be kind to one another. Parking will be a nightmare. So Very much uh, so. Uh, but the... Uh, the sheriff of the county uh, is going to keep the roads flowing. There will be no blocked roads, I understand. They're going to try to keep their might blocked. I wish them luck on that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So. It's going to block the bridge. They're going to block the bridge? That's what I heard. Oh, to traffic? But there will be pedestrians on the bridge. Okay, the Big Max Rural Bridge will be blocked, but pedestrians will be on that. And I saw a photo of STS-135, and that was elbow to elbow on yes, that beautiful bridge. So, Well, Ozzy, good luck. We'll probably see you next Wednesday out of Space View Park. Or Thursday. Or Thursday. <laughs> the launch is Thursday? I think the 27th is a Thursday. Yeah. Uh, no, no. No, it's a Wednesday. It's Wednesday. Yeah, I've been saying Wednesday. I apologize. Yeah. My mistake. Okay. <laughs> well, he's our rocket hobo. All right. Ozzy Osband. Glad to have you here. And he's a, one of the volunteers that were here today uh, having a little bit of uh, uh, getting together training so when we open up January 1st. Thank you very much, Ozzy. Well, today in space history is a very historic day that I can't say enough about, and that is when Snoopy went within 50,000 feet of the moon. Not this Snoopy, but the Snoopy that we call half of the lunar module LM4 that Grumman built. And I'm using a small model today that uh, Marty's going to move uh, uh, zoom in on because we don't want to mess around with our $350 model that you can buy from us. But this is the lander that went to the moon. But first of all, we had to do a dress rehearsal of everything before we landed on the moon. And that's what Apollo 10 did 51 years ago today. Gene Cernan, who passed away 
uh, almost a couple years ago, and Tom Stafford, who's very much alive, Tom's 89 years old, they have got into this lunar module and powered it down, did everything but land on the moon, came within eight miles of it, all right? What they were testing was the descent radar, and, and uh, then of course they had to separate like they were landing on the moon, and this second ascent stage, they call it, has its own motor, and it lifted off. Uh, and then uh, they, they studied the topography going over what they called US-1, where Mare Tranquility landing site was at Apollo 11 actually finally achieved. And also they wanted to practice what if something went wrong at 50,000 feet and they had to abort to orbit. Uh, okay. Uh, so they wanted to test out uh, actually what they actually did do is come within eight miles and then pop off and go up to the command module where John Young had been orbiting the moon. Yes, that's called a landing radar, all right, not descent radar. It was over here. Marty, was it off quad four? Between okay. Two. Qu uh, quad one is to the left of the ladder, two's behind, three there, and quad four is where the landing radar. That's a detail to look for in your models, whether you have that or it's not. It's actually between three, between, and, between three and four. Between three and four. So okay. it had been underneath the landing leg here, Marty says, and he knew because Marty's one of our national treasures that actually worked on the lunar module for Grumman. And uh, so I'm happy he always corrects me. It's not land descent radar, it's landing radar. And that was important to test because this was a computer program that had 64K RAM, kilobits of RAM, all right? They kept having to dump out a program and reprogram it. So what actually happened 51 years ago, if this was a, would have happened to Neil, and Buzz Ar uh, uh, Bu Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin, they would have died. What ha and and there, these astronauts came within two seconds of crashing into the moon when at 50,000 feet, eight miles, they did the usual procedure to pop this off. And immediately what happened, and my finger's in the way, is it started rolling around. Instead of going straight up, off, up to meet John Young, it started rolling around like this about eight times in 15 seconds. And Gene Cernan uttered the first cuss words heard from space. He said, GD, what's happening? We got a buck and bronco on our, our hands here. And Tom Stafford flipped a few switches and, and everything went fine and all the reaction control thrusters worked to reorient it and it went back up to meet John Young. But what happened was uh, Gene Cernan had flipped on some switches and didn't tell Stafford that he, he, he activated one of the, uh, dis, uh, the, the descent radar and there was a ascent radar. Anyway, it got mixed up. There was momentarily uh, 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 some uh, drama and if he hadn't corrected that within two seconds, they would have tumbled, crashed back into the moon. Very dramatic. We knew little about that from the radio transmission of these former test pilots because they were so cool, calm, and collected, okay? Uh, and so what got mixed up was the landing radar and the rendezvous radar. And uh, that sent them into this wild tumble after they separated and Marty's pointed out to me on a note on the board here, and I love it, it didn't pop off, okay? It was a smooth re reaction that, that separated this. Now what I'm always amazed about is how did they separate the electronical connections between the descent stage that weighed about five tons and the ascent stage that weighed five tons because they had to communicate with this engine and everything on the landing uh, uh, radar. Well, Marty's told me, and you can look it up, there was a section over here. Marty, was it up over here on, on the, the leg above four? Quad one. Quad one. Okay, over here, quad one was a big rectangle of wires, about like that, he tells me. And in that wires was a guillotine. And the guillotine was like two uh, nice. chisels. It went on each side of this, and I pre pretend that this is that wire section a bundle of wires that Marty said he was proud to have combed those wires as an electrical engineer so that they were all perfectly there. And at the exact moment when they pushed the ascent stage to lift off, a guillotine, one on each side, went and smashed those, cut those wires cleanly. 
and the, and allowed the ascent stage to separate. All right, and uh, so that was a critical moment. Had that not happened every time, this would have dragged them up, and they uh, if the some wires were connected. So that's a cool thing to look up: is the guillotine that separated the wire, a bundle of about six inches around and four inches tall, like a rectangle of these wires that Marty, our cameraman, combed uh, on the lunar modules that went to the moon. So, uh, and they hit the abort stage uh, when, when that tumbling happened? Hit the abort stage and they separate. Oh, okay, yeah, they hit the abort stage and then it separates up there. And, pop, and does it pop off? It's as smooth as silk ride up. But it wasn't for Gene and, and the first time we tried this. In a, in a lunar environment, and that's why we do these things uh, stages by stages because that could have killed the Apollo 11 astronauts on the moon had they not figured out that, oh, we got to redo a, a computer program there. So that was very dramatic, all right, and uh, one of the historic scary moments that Tom Stafford uh, said uh, uh, he wasn't afraid, okay. Now they did rehearse this in Earth orbit in Apollo 9, which was maybe one of the most crucial of all because the first time they used the Grumman lunar module and they had to do it in Earth orbit. They didn't want to do it around the moon the first time because all the unknowns. Uh, so, uh, and they did that abort stage up and then this is on the, this fell back to the moon, all right, 51 years ago. And they know where it crashed, but it tumbled eight miles down and crashed on the moon. But Snoopy had two people in it, and I keep saying Snoopy. What's the Snoopy, Mark? Well, when you had two spacecraft in orbit, you have to have a call sign. So when Gene and, and uh, so they had a call sign for Apollo 9, and they called it Gumdrop, was the command module, because it looked like a gumdrop, and the service module attached to it. Command module is just a gumdrop feature. The cylinder behind us, the service module that had all the avionics, reaction control thrusters, uh, some life support systems, not all of them, of course. The second was called Spider in Apollo 9 because it looked like a spider. Gumdrop and Spider were the call signs. So the, hey, Spider, how's everything going? Good. Well, the Apollo 11, 10 astronauts named very popular comic strip, Peanuts of the time. I think it still is. We like the movies of Peanuts at Christmas time and so forth. So they called this Charlie Brown, where John Young was orbiting the moon. It was Char hey Charlie Brown, how you doing? And they called this Snoopy. All right, and the legend was born. Charles Schultz, the the uh, artist for Peanuts, got involved in it. So it was Snoopy that went down to the moon while Charlie Brown, the call sign of John Young, orbited the moon. And when they separated, this landed on the moon, like I said. And Snoopy's going up and meeting John, and they did have a, a, a normal ascent docking. Now, they didn't have any rocks or anything to transfer, of course. And when the guys transferred later in the day today, 51 years ago, into the command module, this was pretty much spent. The batteries were wore out. They didn't have... Uh, the uh, uh, fuel cells on the lunar module that was all run by batteries. Fuel cells were too heavy and, and probably too big for this. I'll have to ask Marty about that detail, but they weren't used. This was battery powered. It was used up, but it had a lot of fuel in it. So when it left, they programmed it before they left to orient itself away from the lunar mo the command module and service module and fired it into an orbit around the sun. Guess what? About four years ago, some 45 years after Snoopy was let loose around the sun, some astronomers found it. What they think is it. They're, they're, they're almost 99% sure. We know where Snoopy is orbiting the sun. And guess what? Every 15 years it comes close enough to Earth that someone could go out and snag it. Now close enough to Earth is out past the distance of the moon, all right? Uh, it's probably over 30,000, 300,000 miles away. But in four years, this part of Apollo 10 will be making a journey close to the Earth again. It takes 15 years to go around the sun. So I bet my money that Elon Musk or Jeff Bezos or somebody out there unknown is going to fund a spacecraft that will go get Snoopy, bring it back to Earth orbit, 
so that we can then send something up to bring it safely back to earth and I'll bet you a dollar to a donut that some of you 30 year olds out there will one day go to the Smithsonian Institute in Washington DC and see this part of Snoopy sitting there because why not all the rest of these lunar modules uh, are gone uh, Apollo 9 and Apollo 13 both burned up in the Earth's atmosphere. Of course, we had to use Apollo 13 as the, as the, 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 the uh, uh, lifeboat to get those gentlemen back 50 years ago last month. Uh, the other ones crashed into the lunar surface purposely so that they could hear their seismic uh, instruments uh, uh, ring and so forth. So that's a great story of Apollo 10 and how interesting it was. Uh, uh, and uh, the Snoopy legend lived on, all right? And that's why I have this little Snoopy model here. People have asked, why Mark in your museum you got Snoopy and helmets, all right, all over the place? Uh, what's up with that? Well, the Apollo uh, astronauts were so fond of this that, that they created a legacy that still continues today where the <coughs> Snoopy, the Silver Snoopy Award is, the, is one of the highest awards that a, a, an employee can get because that award is given to the astronauts to you as a NASA contractor or a NASA employee. I don't have a Silver Snoopy with me. In fact, I don't think we have one in our American Space Museum relics because uh, no one has donated one to us and they want to keep it when they have it. And when they do donate it, they want money for it, and they do go for several hundred dollars, even more, depending on who they were from. So, and uh, but the Silver Snoopy Award come from this whole Snoopy concept, and we have Snoopy here, and this was actually autographed by Charlie Duke on top of the helmet. We're not going to see that in there, Marty, but uh, that's the legacy of Snoopy in the space program, and why we see Snoopy in space suits and so forth in the Silver Snoopy Award very revered. It's a little pin that you put on your lapel and I've seen one gentleman that made a ring out of it because uh, he was so proud of it. I'll so and uh, yeah uh, and uh, our IT guy just stuck his head in here Bruce Jacobs who I was bragging about last week and he said I'll bring mine in if you want to see one okay so uh, Bruce has got one. We'd love to see one. We'll, we'll, we'll show him off one day on there. So that's a little bit about Apollo 10, 51 years ago. They stayed in orbit for about another day and did some experiments. And then they hauled back to the moon, or back to Earth from the moon, okay? And from the Earth to the moon, they set an all-time speed record. It took them only 42 hours, less than two days, to get uh, back from the, the moon, all right? Now, that's incredible. Uh, they hot fired that, that uh, rocket on the back of the service module when they decided to come back from the, 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 the moon uh, and, and go back to Earth. Usually it's a three day trip, okay? Uh, uh, and they made it back in 42 hours. Tom Stafford's very proud of this, and, and we've met him several times. He's done things for our museum because he, he lives in Melbourne, about uh, 40 miles south of us. Uh, Apollo 10 set a speed record of 42 hours back from the moon. They averaged just under 25,000 miles an hour. And that's Mach 36 for those of you out there aviators. You'll see a Mach 25 patch on shuttle astronauts because that's the speed that they, they hit uh, uh, getting into orbit and coming back. So 24,791 miles an hour is the exact speed average that Apollo 10 made it back from the, the moon in 42 hours, so their trip ended, it'll be like a, a Monday next week, okay, uh, when their trip ended. And uh, only Tom Stafford's alive. This was a very interesting crew, Apollo 10, because they were all veterans, all right, of two space flights. Uh, Cernan just had one, but Stafford and Young both had two Gemini flights, and they all flew again. Uh, the orbiting John Young from Orlando, Florida, we always have to mention, native son, they have the Orlando John Young Parkway over there. 
He went back to the moon as commander of Apollo 16 and walked on it. And then Gene Cernan was the commander of Apollo 17 and was the last man to have his footprints on the moon. And uh, so we were going to, Marty was going to, we're here at one of the cases here, and Marty's going to pan out to a couple artifacts that I'm going to point out to you, and then we'll, we'll end our program for the week. Of course, I've been sitting by the mighty Saturn V that he's been showing you here. This is a beautiful replica of the Saturn V. We're told it might be worth $30,000, okay? Then over here... Look, look at the little guy. Oh, oh yeah, okay. Yeah, I'm looking. Yeah, point out the, the, the man at the bottom there. If you can envision a football field and then 50 more feet, this is 353 feet tall, and there's a man at the bottom. 363. And the mighty F1 engines, and then he's going to go up and show them where your precious lunar module built by Grumman was under <clears throat> what they call the uh, sloth, right? The sloth? Service uh, limb adapter. Uh, service limb adapter. Service limb adapter, yeah. The sloth. Service limb adapter. And the service module and command module on top. And yes, I kind of argued one day that, well, that service, the escape hatch up there is a, a full 30 feet or something, 25 feet, and that's added into it. And yes, Mark, if we didn't have that on there, you wouldn't have a Saturn V rocket because you wouldn't have an astronaut want to get on it without having an escape system. But some of the cool things we have that, that we didn't ask our collection manager, Nick Enix, to get out, he did get that Snoopy out for us, and we appreciate that. It was in a box, and I, I, I apologize I didn't use gloves, uh, but uh, I just washed my hands thoroughly so there's no oil on them. But uh, Marty's showing you this case. Marty, let's zoom in on the top here, because that'll probably be easy. The, 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 these are actual patches worn on the coveralls of uh, uh, people that worked on the uh, Apollo program, North American Aviation, the uh, NASA project, Saturn S11. Uh, and another North American Aviation, all right, they, they built uh, uh, the, the uh, command module and the service module, I believe, too. The Grumman patch, Grumman workers out of Beth Page, Long Island. North American was out of L.A. And then Boeing, that Boeing patch. All these patches would command a couple hundred dollars, maybe, in our auction, and I'm going to remind you, that our next auction we just posted on Facebook is May 30th. I mean, we've had it posted for a while, but we're promoting it now a week from Saturday. It will be online only, 350 plus objects for our charity auction where we raise uh, a lot of money. The auction usually goes for $100,000 uh, gross of what we sell, and we get a good chunk of that to keep our proud Brevard County uh, nonprofit open. Uh, here's a Snoopy headgear to the left there, another Snoopy thing. The headset worn by Apollo astronauts was commonly called a Snoopy cap because it kind of resembled dog ears on the, on the side. And this is an early mock-up there. So that's a real, not one flown in space, but an early version of it. And you see all the astronauts wearing that. And uh, let's see, up above that, Marty, you can barely see, and that's okay, is a uh, is a pair of rescue hose cutters, specially made to cut the astronauts' hoses if they had to get them out of the, the capsule. There is a spacesuit uh, electrical connector. You didn't realize that the command module, when it was delivered to Kennedy Space Center, was covered in this blue adhesive film to protect the surface. So having a piece of the film that large that covered one of the lunar of the command modules. Uh, that's a, a, a pretty pricey piece there. Right? That could go, uh, if not several hundred dollars, but uh, maybe a thousand or, or so. And these pieces of gold mylar there is what coated the, um, the lunar module for reflection of heat and to keep the other instruments at a better, at the constant temperature. And uh, an eight by eight sheet of that sells for four or five hundred dollars in our auction. And we got a launch pass on there. And Marty, I'll have you go down to the brick, because we love talking about the flame trench brick. And when I talk to community leaders and people in business, 
uh, about our museum, I say there's nor there, around our great country, arrowheads are very common from our North American Indians. Almost in every county of America, you can probably find an arrowhead. Well, there's only one place, Brevard County, where you can get a brick that was blew out of the flame trench during the launch of Apollo 10 on May 18, 1969. This is one of 1,200 bricks that were blown out. We have one in here in our museum, all right? The only place you can they originate from is here, and we have one. And we sold a half of one from the Apollo 11 flame trench, I think, for, 12, for about $2,000 in our last auction. So collectors love these things. They, we can authenticate them that they come from Kennedy Space Center from our own workers. So I'm going to go over here by the desk a minute and uh, sign off by, by, by showing again this beautiful t-shirt. This is one version. There's another version of it that we have for sale. We get to keep some of this money to keep our nonprofit afloat. Once again, we had our docents in here today, giving them some COVID education. When we open up a week from Monday, we will require masks. And once again, we do respect your civil liberties, but please respect that most of our volunteers, 80% of them are retired like myself and uh, are in the wheelhouse to get uh, the, the uh, virus. However, after when we do let you in here, and family and friends, please do come. We've taken away all the hands-on type of, of, of items that, that uh, could spread the virus, and we will have our we have some uh, young people and AARP uh, paid people up at our front desk. Uh, we don't have paid just about three paid people in this whole place, okay? And we use AARP and high school uh, work programs for the front desk and uh, uh, once you're inside here they will clean up right behind you okay we're not going to risk anybody having anything they'll clean up the galleries right behind each other so but it'll still be an awesome experience the only place you can see space memorabilia uh, that's not often seen and the only place you can see some of these models like this beautiful Saturn V uh, that we actually saw one similar we're trying to find out if it is this one at the launch control over there. Uh, we're just eight miles away from where they're going to launch the next humans in space, okay? And boy, are we getting busy with that around here. We're going to be closed physically, but uh, uh, we're involved uh, outside of here, and just the excitement of it uh, is going to be fun. But we all I want to end by just a moment telling everyone that, of course, Monday is Memorial Day, where we salute why we have our own civil liberties here in America and that is our wonderful men and women of the military that have done their duty to protect our freedoms and our civil rights and though all the con all the celebrations are being con canceled across America uh, I know that there's some private things that are happening so the fellowship can continue at some of the veteran centers so enjoy those enjoy your families over Memorial Day weekend and be safe respect everybody and a big shout out to our military friends and veterans like Marty Winkle, uh, uh, our cameraman here, uh, that we're the reason, you're the reason we're here and we know that. So uh, have a wonderful Memorial Day. We will come to you Memorial Day at 2.30 with a program from Dr. Ken Kramer, the hardest working space journalist out there. He's going to give us the moment update on Wednesday's launch, okay? And we'll be back Tuesday with our show will be about the launch. And Wednesday, we're going to bring you the launch live from one of our friends' balconies uh, at a sixth floor condo where we will watch the launch. So we appreciate everybody joining us, and we're happy to help you stay curious. Mark Marquette saying, be safe, enjoy Memorial Day, and God bless the USA.